It's absolutely not too late to solve climate change. Global warming is not a necessary evil at all. We could fix it, but we're just going about it in completely the wrong way. Global temperatures have passed now 1.1 degrees, uh, rising rapidly, about a quarter of a degree per decade. We've only got a few decades to stop global warming. And to do that, we've got to reduce emissions, which are carrying on at the moment at around 40 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide per year. We've got to reduce them to zero. I'm Miles Allen, a professor of geosystem science here in the School of Geography and the Environment and in the Department of Physics here in the University of Oxford. I'm also the director of Oxford Net Zero. Well, every tonne of carbon dioxide we dump into the atmosphere drives up global temperatures a little bit further and leaves them up. And the only way we will get global temperatures back down again is by physically taking that carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere. So meeting our climate goals is all about what do we do with that excess? Where do we put it? It can't go in the atmosphere. It's got to go somewhere else. It can't go in the biosphere. The biosphere can't, doesn't have the absorptive capacity to take it all up. It's got to go back underground. And that's what we need to be developing as a capability of doing. Carbon capture is the process of capturing the carbon dioxide either from the air or from a, a source of carbon dioxide where it's being generated from a, a chimney of a power station or, or refinery. Purifying it, compressing it, and then re-injecting it back underground. If you compress it enough, you make it into a, a liquid which has quite similar properties to the hydrocarbons it was made from, and that can be re-injected back underground into something like a saline aquifer or a depleted oil or gas field, and it will then stay there because once it's compressed and injected deep enough, it's under sufficient pressure that it remains in that form and doesn't leak out again. Point source capture is, as it sounds, where you find a point source, like a factory or a refinery, an ammonia plant, something which generates a stream of relatively high concentration carbon dioxide. Well, direct air capture is the way we would address emissions there where we can't capture them at source. For example, what comes out the back of a jet aircraft. To compensate for those kinds of emissions, we need to recapture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And there's broadly speaking two ways of doing it. There's biologically mediated air capture, if you like, where we grow trees, with the trees capture carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, we burn the trees, capture the carbon dioxide when the trees are burned, and then compress it and inject it underground. The challenge with that is the land and the water required to grow the trees. You know, land is going to be in short supply in 50 years' time. So people are quite concerned about relying on biological capture methods. And there's increasing attention now to engineered air capture methods where we pass air literally through a machine that strips out the carbon dioxide and delivers a pure stream of carbon dioxide which can be compressed and re-injected underground. That's a lot more expensive than growing trees, but costs are coming down. One of the big drivers of the high cost of carbon capture at the moment is uncertainty about future policies. It's a very capital intensive activity. You need to invest a lot of money to build a carbon capture plant. If nobody's quite sure if you're going to need it in 10 years time, they're going to demand a high rate of return on their money and that makes the plants expensive. But if people knew this was going to be needed for 20, 30 years into the future, then you'd be able to get your money much cheaper and that would bring down the costs dramatically. There's two ways of persuading industry to do something. Um, there's give it a price incentive or there's to tell it to do it. We don't give a price incentive to the nuclear industry to dispose of nuclear waste. We just tell it to dispose of the nuclear waste. And that's the way we should be approaching the carbon capture problem. Because you start small, you start requiring it to get rid of, you know, a tenth of 1%, that's what they're doing at the moment. Then you go up to 1% and so on. That would actually add very little to the cost of fossil fuel based products. Of course, eventually you're going to have to get international agreement that everybody's going to do this. But that's what you're going to have to do to, to reach net zero anyway. And in many ways, this kind of mandate would be easier to globalize because this is very easy to document. Has, is, you know, you're buying some fossil carbon, has the CO2 been disposed of or not? You know, is it, is it certified or not? Of course, environmentalists are concerned that if we require the fossil fuel industry to get rid of its CO2 and they succeed in doing so, 
then that kind of legitimizes the fossil fuel industry. But I re-emphasize, this industry will not disappear fast enough to solve climate change in time. That's why we have to get the industry on board to fix its own problem. So the only entities in the world that actually have the engineering capability, the cash flow, the access to capital to get rid of carbon dioxide on this kind of scale are the oil and gas companies themselves. Now, if the industry knew that by 2050, as a license to operate condition, it was going to have to get rid of one tonne of CO2 for every tonne generated by the products it sells, it would absolutely do it. So we should just change the conversation to, you need this in order to continue in the business you're in. And therefore, you need to get on with doing it yourselves. So I argue that what we need is what I call a hard net zero. And that means 100% geological disposal of every tonne of carbon dioxide generated by continued use of fossil fuels at that time. To contrast with a, what you might call a soft net zero, where you're still allowing a tonne of CO2 to be released from burning fossil carbon and mopped up somewhere else by planting trees. That's fine in the short term, but there's a limit to how much carbon the biosphere can absorb. And indeed, as the world warms, the biosphere is predicted to start releasing carbon back into the atmosphere. So we need hard net zero soon after 2050. Just working back from there, we can just plot our path to there by what fraction of the carbon dioxide generated by fossil fuels are we disposing of back underground at any point in time. 10% by 2030, 50% by 2040, 100% by 2050. That would work, that would get us there. So I think we should focus on capturing the point sources first, but knowing that there will be applications of fossil fuels, like aviation, for example, where there is no alternative to direct air capture. It's crucial that we understand that but over the next couple of decades, less and less of the carbon dioxide generated by our continued use of fossil fuels will actually come from conventional power generation. But it's applications where we need intense heat for, say, smelting of iron, making steel, making cement. These are the areas where it's much, much harder to get rid of carbon from the system. Now, there are, of course, ideas out there like making carbon-free cement or making steel using arc electric furnaces. The difficulty, of course, with these alternatives is they are very expensive. And so I think it's important that we set the, the rules in place to allow industry to compete on a level playing field. If the fossil fuel industry can get rid of its CO2, then let them compete with the arc furnaces of the future making steel. And as long as neither process is generating CO2 and dumping it into the atmosphere, then let the cheapest one win. We're going to need air capture on a massive scale um, within a few decades' time, much, much fewer decades than most people think, because we won't be able to do this by simply planting trees. There isn't the land, there isn't the water available to do that. We need to be disposing, ton for ton, one ton of carbon dioxide for every ton generated by our continued use of fossil fuels. Right now, globally, we dispose of less than 0.1%. And collectively, we've somehow committed to getting that number to 100%. That's an increase of a thousand fold over the next 30 years. That's great. It could be done, but we've got to get on with it.